following presentation will focus on minimally invasive mitral valve surgery, the surgical setup, the technique with a special focus on the loop technique which has been introduced by Friedrich Mohr and von Oppel in the late 90s. The first minimally invasive mitral valve operation was performed by Alain Carpentier one of the pioneers in mitral valve surgery in 1996. In our first analysis of 1,339 consecutive patients, we could demonstrate a repair rate of 87%, a low rate of conversion to full stenotomy, 30-day mortality was 2.4%, and we could demonstrate that minimum invasive mitral valve repair is a safe and effective procedure. In the majority of cases, the mitral valve is operated under direct vision at our institution. However, some cases are performed using pure videoscopic vision, which has been promoted by Hugo Vannemann. The goal of minimally invasive mitral valve surgery is to perform the operation with the same height repair rate compared to conventional mitral valve surgery through median stenotomy and without putting the patient at a higher surgical risk. Avoiding stenotomy has major advantages for the patient like decreased surgical trauma, decreased postoperative pain, improved cosmesis, and therefore quicker recovery. Indications for minimal invasive mitral surgery at our institutions are isolated mitral replacement, isolated mitral repair, also complex cases, mitral surgery with concomitant procedures like tricuspid valve surgery, MACE procedure, PFOASD closure, myectomy for hokum, and also mitral surgery following previous sternotomy. There are specific contraindications for this excess, for example, previous right thoracotomy with severe adhesions, a heavily calcified mitral of annulus or severe annular abscess formation, and aortic regurgitation higher grade 1 degree. There are also relative contraindications for the minimally invasive access like renal procedures, pathologies of the descending aorta or unsuitable femoral arteries, and sometimes chest abnormalities where the heart is shifted to the left side. In 2000, Mohr and von Oppel introduced a loop technique for accessing the adequate length of the loops, a measuring device is placed on the tip of the peripheral muscle and the corresponding end of the leaflet. On average, the length for a posterior mitral leaflet is 12 to 40 mm and for the anterior 22 to 24 mm. The use of artificial cordia is not new. They had been introduced by Tyron David in 1989 and by Claudio Zussa in 1990. We use the loop technique as our standard technique for mitral repair because we think it's precise and reproducible. It has advantages for the knot pusher and it follows natural rules. In 2009, we published our results where we compared uh, different forms of mitral pathologies. We compared posterior anterior and bileaflet prolapse through the minimally invasive excess. In our first series, we had a zero intraoperative mortality. We had a very low rate of conversion to full sternotomy. In 5.2%, we had the patient taken back for bleeding. Stroke rate was 1.4%, 30-day mortality 1.8%. With a mean follow-up time of 2.7 years, follow-up was 99% complete. With the loop technique, we were able to achieve a repair rate of almost 97% for prolapse of the posterior mitral leaflet, of 91% for prolapse of the anterior mitral leaflet, and a repair rate of over 90% for bileaflet prolapse.
freedom from reoperation at eight years was 95.1% for posterior mitral leaflet prolapse, 92.4% for anterior mitral leaflet prolapse, and almost 96% for bileaflet mitral valve prolapse. We could demonstrate in a prospective uh, randomized trial that with a loop technique compared to a resection technique, we were able to uh, achieve a greater length of leaflet cooptation. Besides a significant greater length of cooptation, patients undergoing the loop technique also received significantly larger plaster rings in this study. With the loop technique, we could achieve similar, if not better, results compared to resection technique. And this technique simplifies mitral valve repair, especially through a minimally invasive mitral valve excess. The following slides will focus on the surgical technique and are divided into groin cannulation, lateral thoracotomy, operative setup, visualization of the mitral valve, and mitral valve repair. Following an, an oblique incision about 3 cm over the right groin, the femoral artery and vein are dissected only superficial. Purse string sutures are placed on both vessels and they are cannulated using Seldinger's technique under echo control. It is of most important that the anesthetist who performs the echo works close together with the surgeon to confirm exact placement of the guiding wires. In all patients undergoing isolated mitral surgery, over a weight of 75 kilograms, an additional venous neck cannula is placed preoperatively into the superior vena cava by the anesthetist for improved venous drainage. Vacuum suction is used in all cases. An aortic cannula is also placed under echo guidance. Pressures up to 350 millimeters of mercury are accepted. Alternative cannulation sites for the arterial line are the axillary cannula. In rare cases where venous drainage is poor intraoptively, an additional venous cannula can be placed into the superior vena cava and brought out through the minimally invasive excess. The arterial line is secured. Having the patient positioned on its back with the right side of moderate lifted up, the chest is entered in the fourth or fifth intercostal space. It is very helpful to mark the anticipated area of skin incision before the foil is applied because especially in a woman the foil is used to push the breast anteriorly and superiorly. It is also advisable to mark the midline of the sternum just in case of urgent stenotomy is required. Conversion to full stonotomy must be available at all times. In obese women with large breasts, it is very useful to enter the chest superior to the breast after the right breast has been pushed downwards. A surgical incision into the thorac cavity should follow, follow the principles always higher than you think in men, one intercostal space higher, and in women, two intercostal space higher. A soft tissue retractor is used to open the incision and an additional retractor is inserted to access the right chest. Retraction sutures can be placed on the diaphragm for better visualization of the pericardium or the diaphragm is just pushed away using a flexible blade which is fixed in between the lower rib and the retractor. The first additional incision should be positioned anterior in a safe distance to the right internal thoracic artery. 
This incision will be used for the holder on the left atrial retractor blade and may be also used for getting the cardioplegia line out. The incision for the X clam should be directed towards the ascending aorta without putting any force onto the aorta after the left atrium has been retracted. Care must be taken to avoid interference with the camera, which should be inserted anterior and superior to the X clamp, accomplishing a direct view onto the mitral valve. One or two of these additional incisions can be used for later getting the chest drains out. Visualization of the mitral valve. Following incision of the pericardium about 3 cm above the phrenic nerve, pericardial retraction sutures may be applied and brought out laterally. Using a pursing suture, needle vent is brought into the aortic root for application of cardioplegia and later venting of the aortic root. After cross clamping, the left atrium is entered through the interatrial groove. It is advisable to apply the cross clamp during a short duration of complete circulatory arrest to avoid potential risk of aortic dissection. It is also helpful to apply additional retraction sutures above the interatrial groove. The left atrium is entered and lifted up using a retractor blade which is available in different sizes and length. In some cases, the blade used for pushing the diaphragm away can also be used to improve visualization of the mitral valve by pushing the inferior part of the left atrium incision downwards. The mitral valve is assessed and the pathology is defined. The preoperative echo gives relevant information about the pathology of the mitral valve. After assessing mitral valve pathology, an adequate length of pre-manufactured Gore-Tex loops are placed onto the specific papillary muscle. Each set of neocords is composed of four loops, which are anchored to the specific papillary muscle by getting two sutures through the muscle, which are then knotted over two Teflon platelets. The free edges of the loops are then positioned at the corresponding free edges of the leaflet, using an additional four Gore suture for each loop. If less than four neocords are necessary, two loops may be sutured to the leaflet at once. For a simple posterior leaflet prolapse, P2, loops in the majority of cases coming from the posterior medial papillary muscle are enough to accomplish an adequate reconstructive result. The remaining mitral valve repair follows standard techniques. The annulus is always stabilized by using a ring. Here the use of the knot pusher with the help of the assistant doctors is demonstrated. The ring sutures are cut and the knots of the loops which had been anchored to the leaflets will disappear within the cooptation line. Each repair is checked by echo. The echo also gives you relevant information regarding a patent circumflex artery and the length of cooptation.
In conclusion, minimally invasive mitral valve surgery can be used as a standard technique for mitral valve surgery even in complex cases of mitral valve repair. The loop technique simplifies mitral valve repair through the success and accomplished excellent surgical results. Minimally invasive mitral valve surgery offers decreased surgical trauma, less pain, improved cosmesis and quicker recovery, which are the major advantages of this technique over conventional access through full sonotomy and of most importance for the patients.